Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here today. And we're going to talk, actually, not surprisingly, about some of the same issues um, in the relapse refractory setting. Um, so here's my disclosures. I am going to be talking about off, uh, currently still off-label use of lenalidomide, um, but I'll show you data to justify that. So if you were going to go to the NCCN guidelines, you have a relapse follicular patient, what in the world should I do with them? The good news and the bad news is it's kind of coming up, I'm sure, in a lot of these diseases is we have a lot of drugs. The question becomes what order or exactly how to use them. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on chemotherapy. I'm going to kind of focus on kind of the more novel or newer therapies. But of course, um, someone responded to chemotherapy in the past. You gave them BR. Of course, uh, CHOP is on the, on the table. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about lenalidomide. Um, I'm going to particularly focus on the PA3 kinase inhibitors, in particular kind of what's similar and what's different about them, because I think this is one place that gets a little bit confusing as more drugs are coming to market. Um, I'm also not going to spend really much time on radioimmunotherapy, but just to say that it still exists. It's still an option out there. And um, I actually recently came across a long-term follow-up, um, which showed uh, CR rates in the relapse setting of over 50% with another 10 or 15% PR. So it still is a therapy that has some utility and is worth thinking about if you have that option available to you. But when you have the patient in front of you, what are the things you might want to think about when you're trying to decide, what am I going to do next? Um, I am a pretty big proponent of biopsying these patients. You really want to make sure you're still dealing with follicular lymphoma or else you're going to run into trouble. Um, and in particular, if they've, the grading has changed at all, which obviously is going to drive your therapy choice. But the things that sort of I really think about are, what was my previous therapy? Is it a patient, like Dr. Leonard said, where he gave them upfront um, rituximab and they got three, four, five years out of it? Then you might just retreat again. Um, if they're a patient who you gave um, rituximab and chemotherapy to and they got a long duration of response out of it, well, then you actually might consider chemotherapy again because they're chemotherapy sensitive. On the flip side, someone who you gave chemotherapy to and is relapsing fairly quickly, you might want to then think about a uh, me different mechanism of action for that patient. A lot of this is going to come down to patient preference, things like the duration of therapy and the route of administration. We now have oral options. Um, you know, the nice thing about chemotherapy is it's six cycles and you're done, sometimes even shorter, which can be a big appeal to some patients versus these uh, newer therapies like the PI3 kinase inhibitors where the duration of therapy at this point would be considered indefinite, and of course, adverse events. So one group I do want to highlight is uh, the group that relapses quickly. So we don't know yet how to identify these people prospectively, but there is a group of patients retrospectively who relapse within the first two years of their therapy. So they do not, do not achieve what's called EFS 24. And so this is, um, came out of the Iowa Mayo group where they took uh, patients who were treated with chemoimmunotherapy and then looked at the ones who did achieve a remission and maintained it um, at 24 months. And these dotted lines here are just sort of the overall, the normal population survival. And the um, solid lines here, these are the, patient, these are the patients. And when you look at the, um, the MER, which is the Iowa Mayo data, or you look at the Lion data, which came out of France, you can see that in both of these situations, that patients who do indeed achieve a remission and maintain it for some period of time in the first two years do pretty well, and their overall survival is very similar to the general population. These people maybe you don't have to worry about so much. On the flip side, you have a population of patients that you treat up front, you give them chemoimmunotherapy, and within the first two years, they are progressing. This is a population that does not do well. When you look at the Iowa Mayo data, you've got patients here at five years with a 50% overall survival. I mean, we're getting into DLBCL territory at this point. Um, the survival was a little bit better for the French data, and we'll not spend time speculating on why that is, but certainly it does seem like these patients who relapse early, this could be a different biology, and they certainly don't do as well, and we have to maybe think about them a little bit differently. Um, Dr. Leonard mentioned the M7 Flippy, um, so I won't really go into much detail about this other than to say that the, now the kit challenge is to validate this prospectively and see if this can be a prospective tool um, to help select who these patients are up front, because right now we can only identify them in retrospect. Um, so I'll put in a plug for a SWOG study that's ongoing right now, S1618, uh, 16, and this is specifically looking at this early relapsing population. So this is enrolling patients who relapsed within the first two years of their chemoimmunotherapy. Initially, the study was written for patients who got BR up front, but has since been amended, so patients who got RCHOP up front are now able to enroll on this study. 
Um, there is a specimen submission, and that way they can actually validate the M7 FLPI, see what these patients' scores would be, and then maybe we can consider using that more upfront as we go forward. And they're getting randomized to a PA3 kinase inhibitor with obinutuzumab, lenalidomide with obinutuzumab, or whatever chemotherapy they didn't have before with obinutuzumab. And we'll get a sense of whether or not chemo more chemotherapy makes sense in these patients versus changing to a different mechanism of action. So what is the difference between the two antibodies? So I just want to take a second just to remind ourselves, what's the difference between rituximab and obinutuzumab, and why might we want to make a change? So rituximab is a type 1 monoclonal antibody, and to be honest, no one's entirely sure how it works in vivo. There, you can find evidence for a couple of different mechanisms, but what happens is, is when rituximab binds to CD20, they congregate into what are called lipid raft domains, and that actually um, starts off some internal signaling. Um, so there is some, for example, evidence that perhaps um, CD anti um, rituximab can directly activate, for example, apoptosis. Um, it also um, has a mechanism of complement mediated lysis as well as ADCC. On the flip side, these kind of newer antibodies, these type 2 antibodies, were kind of designed with the thought that maybe ADCC is the most important mechanism of action or antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, and maybe we should engineer the antibody to kind of more strongly activate ADCC. And so in this situation, um, there is not congregation to the lipid raft domains, and um, the epitope is, uh, they're different, but they overlap. So it's a slightly different uh, part of, anti of CD20, but there is overlap between the two antibodies. So this is why, theoretically, maybe why, um, even if a patient pro progresses on rituximab, this has a slightly different mechanism of action, so maybe abinutuzumab makes sense. And abizituzumab got FDA approved in 2016 um, after the Gadolin trial, which looked at bendamustine alone versus BO um, in relapse refractory indolent NHL. These patients all had to have a median of two prior therapies, and they were considered rituximab uh, resistant, which meant that they had to progress within six months of getting a rituximab-containing regimen. Um, Medium length of follow-up was just under two years, and in terms of progression-free survival, um, it was not reached for the bendamustine and benetuzumab arm. Um, adverse events, uh, grade three uh, toxicities were about similar in frequency. Um, neutropenia was not significantly different, and um, deaths due to AEs were about the same. And so we talked a little bit in the upfront setting about lenalidomide rituximab, and if, certainly it looks like it's starting to have a place in the relapse refractory setting as well. So this was a study that looked at a single arm, uh, single agent rituximab versus the combination. And now, of course, in this situation, these patients had to be considered rituxin sensitive. They had to have responded in the past and had a period of time off of it. Um, but you can see that when you use the combination, you have a significantly improved um, median PFS um, over three years uh, versus 14.1 uh, months looking at just rituximab. Now, of course, you add more therapy, as was clear in the last talk, you add more toxicity. Um, so not surprisingly, once you start adding uh, lenalidomide into the mix, you have um, increased rate of infections, you have more cutaneous reactions, um, and you can get tumor flare with lenalidomide in, um, in follicular lymphoma, which is worth just keeping an eye out for when, if you do choose to use this regimen and you see these patients clinically. Um, there's a suggestion that... Um, Perhaps there's a slightly improved overall survival with the combination, but again, these confidence intervals um, overlap, and that was certainly not a primary endpoint, so I wouldn't actually make that claim. Um, and obviously, you have more grade three or four toxicities once you start combining therapies, um, mostly due to increased cytopenias, which typically are manageable with uh, dose reductions um, or interruptions, but still something to be aware of. So again, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the PI3 kinase inhibitors because this is a field that's really kind of exploded over the last couple of years, and there's similarities between these drugs, and there's differences, and how do you decide which one you might want to use in your patient? Um, so the three that are currently FDA approved, we have idololisib, which was the first one um, to come onto market, which targets specifically the delta isoform. It is POBID. Um, Duvelisib is actually the most recent one that was FDA approved, but I kind of put it second because it has a few similarities with idololisib. It, uh, it targets both delta and gamma, um, also POBID dosing. And then capamlicid, which is kind of the oddball, um, it targets alpha and delta isoforms, and it's IV um, with a weekly dosing schedule. So 
All of these were approved based on single arm phase two trials with slightly different eligibility criteria. So for uh, the Delta study, for idololisib, um, you had to have uh, indolent uh, NHL that was refractory to rituxent and a chemotherapy that contained an alkylator, and all of these had a primary endpoint of overall response rate. Um, so not surprisingly, median age was about 64, so pretty representative of the typical follicular lymphoma population, and median number of prior regimens was relatively high at four. So if you look at the uh, waterfall plot for idololisib, you have an overall response rate in the whole cohort of 57% versus if you specifically look at the follicular lymphoma patients, which were the majority of the study, you're looking at an overall response rate of 54%. Progression-free survival was about 11 months, and overall survival was 20.3 months. When you look at Develisib, which again is the other oral option we have, again, it was a single arm phase two trial, uh, but these patients, a uh, little bit different eligibility criteria. They could have been refractory in chemoimmunotherapy or radioimmunotherapy, and they didn't specify whether or not the patient must have had an alkylator. But again, same uh, primary endpoint of overall response rate, and because the uh, concerns about infections were now starting to creep up with idololisib, um, they did uh, mandate prophylaxis for PJP um, and uh, herp uh, herpes viruses for this study. Um, again, similar median age. And then in this case, median number of therapies was three, so slightly lower, slightly less treated population. But again, the waterfall plot looks fairly similar. Um, again, in this case, we had an overall response rate of 47%, and again, about 42% uh, when you look specifically at the follicular lymphoma subgroup. Median PFS was 9.5 months in this trial and medium overall survival was uh, about 29 months. And then Kronos 1, which was a copanlisib, again, single arm phase two. This was a slightly more pretreated population. It was specific that they had to have two or more prior therapies. Uh, again, similar median age of 63, and their median number of prior therapies was again uh, three. Here's their waterfall plot, maybe a slightly more responders if you wanted to look at it roughly. Uh, overall response rate both uh, for the entire population and follicular lymphoma, uh, 59%. Uh, median PFS was 11.2 months. And in this particular case, they didn't reach their uh, overall survival. So the asterisks are there because we all know that we're not supposed to compare single arm phase two trials because they use slightly different eligibility criteria. But for the time being, it's the best we have. So we will do this with that, um, with that caveat. So relatively similar overall response rates for all three agents, maybe, maybe slightly lower for Juvelisib. Median PFS was very similar between the three. Um, and overall survival in general, we're looking at a ballpark of probably 20 to 30 months. And we'll see what Copanlisib shakes out to be. But probably more practically when you're thinking about these, you're probably gonna think about the toxicity profile. I know I certainly do, and I actually typically don't really like idilolisib because I don't particularly like the side effect profile. Um, and pneumonitis is, I think, probably the one that we're all most scared about. Um, but we also have other um, immune-related side effects that are relatively common that we need to think about. So idilolisib, the grade three, uh, four diarrhea rates, about 13%. Uh, Transaminitises are about the same there. Now, for Duvelisib, it has a similar rate of diarrhea, um, but the transaminitis is a little bit lower. And Copanlisib, actually, because of the, it targets the alpha isoform, has a slightly different side effect profile. So these immune-related toxicities are lower than the other three, but it has its own um, set of issues that we'll mention in a minute. If you're looking at the hematologic toxicity, because a lot of these patients certainly will have impaired, um, will have cytopenias either due to their disease or due to prior therapy. Those are things we need to think about. Um, for capanlisib and idololisib, they're relatively similar, uh, slightly higher rates of cytopenias um, in the duvelisib. And like I mentioned, there's a slightly different side effect profile for copanlisib because it targets the alpha isoform. And it, it can cause um, hypertension and hyperglycemia to, when you look at this, though, it really tends to happen in the peri-infusional setting, um, and it's relatively manageable. Um, but it is something to think about, particularly if you have a patient who has poor, bad diabetes, has other cardiovascular risk factors, um, and you're trying to have a frank discussion with the patient about what should you do next. Um, these particular AEs were actually not reported um, with the other drugs. <clears throat> 
I do actually want to take a second to talk about what doesn't work. Um, whenever I sometimes go to talks and sometimes people put up these slides of therapies people are using in relapse, refractory, follicular lymphoma, I'm always surprised when abrutinib comes up. And I think that's probably because we've gotten so comfortable using it in other um, lymphomas, in particular probably CLL. It's not a great drug in follicular lymphoma. If you look at the phase two data, um, the overall response rate is only 20.9%. So that's not nothing, um, but compared to these other um, drugs that we're talking about who, that have a response rates of 40% and upwards, um, it's really not a great option, all things considered. The other one that's, I think, maybe a little bit curious is uh, venetoclax, because we all know that we define, essentially, follicular lymphoma by the fact that it has a translocation that affects BCL2. So you would think that maybe a BCL2 inhibitor would work, and to be honest, it kind of doesn't. Um, when you look at the original phase one data and it kind of just all relapsed refractory um, lymphomas, um, the response rate was 38%, and there was originally maybe some thought that that was because the follicular lymphoma patients may have gotten been in the lower dosing cohorts. But then when that was uh, moved on to a phase two experience in combination with rituximab, where everyone got the same dose of the venetoclax, the response rate was exactly the same. Um, so even though BCL2 is sort of is translocated in this disease, this disease isn't really dependent on BCL2 for survival the way that CLL is. Um, so maybe this will change in combinations, but for now I would not necessarily be reaching for venetoclax for follicular lymphoma. So what's coming? Um, so polituzumab is an anti-CD79A antibody, which people are excited about in a number of lymphomas. Um, and there's some ongoing studies, both in combination with the anti-CD20 antibodies, as well as other novel agents like lenalidomide and some of the other therapies. Um, bite antibodies. Um, in particular, for example, we have a CD20, um, CD3 construct um, on clinical trial available right now. Um, they seem to be, early on, look very exciting um, in lymphomas in general, but also in follicular lymphoma. Um, one thing just to kind of mention about sort of the newer bite constructs is, um, it, for example, blenitumumab uh, is kind of that continuous infusion, the patient's walking around for a month with a chemo pump. Um, the newer, newer uh, agents are kind of uh, uh, you know, weekly infusions in clinic, like a lot of other things we give, so much more uh, practical um, for our patients. And so hopefully we'll see how these shake out. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on CAR-T because there's people who know way more about that. They're going to be talking later today. Um, but just to say that obviously there's some early data, and I'm sure we'll continue to see more data on CAR-T um, in follicular lymphoma as well as the other diseases. So in summary, how do we th I think about these patients? So certainly, just to put into their own category, these patients who fail um, to achieve an EFS 24 certainly have a more aggressive clinical course. What do we do with them? We don't really know, but that's uh, exactly what S1618 is looking at, and perhaps we'll have that answer in a few years. Um, R squared certainly has activity in the relapse refractory setting. Um, it's under FDA re uh, review right now, so I suspect we'll be hearing a lot more about that relatively soon. Um, the approved PI3 kinase inhibitors, they have relatively similar efficacy, but you're probably going to want to make your decision based on two things, which is their adverse event profile, um, what's your, how fearful are you or your patient um, of the immune-related side effects versus the convenience of an oral drug um, versus having to come in for an IV infusion. Um, and the number of options is just going to continue to explode, I think, over the next couple of years. I think we're soon going to be in a similar boat of myeloma where we have lots of drugs and we just don't know what order to use them in. Um, and a couple of things I think you're going to be seeing are the anti-CD979 uh, antibodies, um, as well as probably some additional PI3 kinase inhibitors, as was mentioned in the um, in the T-cell lymphoma talk. And so unfortunately, I think this is going to get a little bit more complicated before we get some clarity. Um, but the good news is our patients uh, do have more options than they did even a few years ago. Um, and with that, I think I'll end and we'll move forward.